I recently moved into an old but charming house in a small town. It was a bit run down, but it had character, and I thought it would be the perfect place to start fresh. One of the selling points was the attic, a large space perfect for storage and maybe even a little workshop. After settling in, I finally decided to explore the attic. The previous owners had left behind some old furniture and boxes. While rummaging through them, I noticed a door at the far end of the attic. It was small, almost child-sized, and seemed oddly out of place. The realtor never mentioned this. Curiosity got the better of me, and I tried the handle. It was locked. Determined, I searched the house and found an old, rusty key in a drawer full of miscellaneous items. It fit the lock perfectly. The door creaked open to reveal a narrow staircase leading down. I grabbed a flashlight and descended. The air grew colder with each step, and the smell of damp earth filled my nose. At the bottom of the stairs was another door, this one more imposing. Carved into the wood were strange symbols that gave me an uneasy feeling. I hesitated, but my curiosity won again. I pushed the door open and stepped into a small, dimly lit room. It looked like it hadn't been touched in decades. The walls were lined with old photographs, yellowed with age. Each photo depicted different families, all standing in front of this very house. As I examined the photos, I noticed something chilling. The same figure appeared in every one. It was a tall man, standing in the background, always with the same eerie smile. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. In the corner of the room, I found an old journal. The entries were written in a frantic hand. The last entry caught my eye. June 15th, 1945. He's back. I can hear him at night, whispering through the walls. The man from the photographs, he wants something. I don't know how much longer I can keep him at bay. Suddenly, I heard a soft whispering behind me. I spun around, flashlight beam dancing across the room. Nothing. I told myself it was just my imagination and quickly left the room, locking the door behind me. That night I had trouble sleeping. The house felt different, colder. I kept hearing faint whispers, but I couldn't make out any words. I tried to ignore it, but sleep wouldn't come. At around 3 a.m., I woke up to the sound of footsteps outside my bedroom door. They were slow, deliberate. I held my breath, heart pounding in my chest. The footsteps stopped right outside my door. Then, the whispering started again, clearer this time. Let me in. I bolted upright and turned on the lights. The footsteps retreated, and the house fell silent again. I stayed awake until dawn, too terrified to close my eyes. The next day, I decided I had to leave. I packed my bags and called a friend to help me move. As I was loading the last of my things into the car, I glanced up at the attic window. The man from the photographs was standing there, smiling down at me. I drove away as fast as I could. I never went back. I later found out that the house had a dark history. Multiple families had lived there, but none stayed for long. Each family reported strange occurrences, always centered around that hidden room. The man in the photographs was believed to be a former owner who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. I don't know what he wanted, and I don't want to find out. All I know is that I'm never going near that house again. A few months later, I found myself restless. Despite the terror I experienced, a part of me felt drawn back to that house. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to uncover, more to understand. Against my better judgment, I began researching the house and its previous owners. I discovered that the house was built in the early 1900s by a wealthy businessman named Jonathan Hawthorne. He lived there with his wife and two children. The family was well liked in the community, but one day they vanished without a trace. The house remained vacant for years until it was sold to a series of families, none of whom stayed long. There were rumors about Jonathan Hawthorne. Some said he was involved in dark rituals that he dabbled in the occult. Others believed he was simply a man driven mad by grief after the loss of his family. Whatever the truth, his presence lingered in the house. My curiosity grew into an obsession. I contacted local historians, scoured archives, and even reached out to paranormal investigators. Most people were reluctant to talk about the house, but I managed to gather fragments of stories, pieces of a dark puzzle. One evening, I received a call from an elderly woman named Margaret. She claimed to be the granddaughter of one of the families who had lived in the house. She told me about her grandfather, a man named Samuel. According to her, Samuel had experienced similar disturbances, whispers, footsteps, and the feeling of being watched. Margaret invited 
me to her home, saying she had something to show me. When I arrived, she led me to a small cluttered room filled with old documents and photographs. She handed me a worn leather-bound book. This was my grandfather's journal, she said. He wrote about the house, about the man and the photographs. I think it might help you understand what you're dealing with. I spent hours reading Samuel's journal. His entries were filled with accounts of strange occurrences and his growing fear. He described the man from the photographs in chilling detail. The same eerie smile, the same cold eyes. But there was something else. Samuel believed that the man was trying to communicate, trying to convey a message. One entry stood out. June 15, 1955. I've discovered something in the attic, behind the wall near the hidden room. There's a loose brick. When I removed it, I found a small box. Inside, there was a letter addressed to Jonathan Hawthorne. I haven't opened it yet. I'm too afraid. Margaret told me that her grandfather had never opened the letter. He died shortly after writing that entry, his death shrouded in mystery. The box and the letter were never found. Determined to find the box, I decided to return to the house. I knew it was risky, but I needed answers. I reached out to the current owners, a young couple who had recently moved in. They were hesitant, but agreed to let me explore the attic under their supervision. When I arrived, the couple seemed anxious. They admitted that they had experienced some strange occurrences, but tried to brush them off. I didn't want to scare them further, so I kept my intentions vague. We climbed up to the attic together. The couple waited near the entrance while I made my way to the far end, where the hidden room was. The door was still locked, just as I had left it. I took a deep breath and turned the key. The room was exactly as I remembered it. I moved to the wall Samuel had mentioned in his journal and began tapping on the bricks. After a few minutes, I found the loose one. Carefully, I pried it out, revealing a small cavity. Inside was a dusty wooden box. My hands trembled as I opened the box. Inside was an old yellowed envelope addressed to Jonathan Hawthorne. I hesitated for a moment, then carefully opened the envelope and unfolded the letter. The letter was written in a beautiful, flowing script. It read, My dearest Jonathan, if you are reading this, then my fears have come to pass. The ritual we performed has gone terribly wrong. The entity we summoned is not what we thought. It is malevolent, and it has taken our children. I can hear their cries in the night, but I cannot reach them. I have tried to reverse the ritual, but I lack the knowledge and the strength. Please, if you find this letter, seek help. There must be a way to banish this entity and save our family. Do not let our children suffer for our mistakes. Yours forever, Eleanor. I felt a chill run down my spine. The stories were true. Jonathan and Eleanor Hawthorne had dabbled in the occult, and their actions had unleashed something terrible. The entity they summoned had taken their children, and possibly countless others over the years. As I stood there, the temperature in the room dropped suddenly. My breath came out in visible puffs, and the familiar whispering began again. This time, it was louder, more insistent. Let me in. Let me in. I turned to leave, but the door slammed shut, trapping me inside. Panic set in as I banged on the door, shouting for the couple to help me. The whispering grew louder, and I could feel a presence closing in on me. Desperate, I remembered the letter. If the entity was summoned by a ritual, perhaps it could be banished by another. I searched the room for any clues, any sign of how to undo what had been done. In a corner, I found a small, dusty book. It was filled with symbols and incantations. Flipping through the pages, I found what I was looking for, a ritual to banish malevolent entities. It required a series of symbols to be drawn, and a specific incantation to be recited. I hurriedly drew the symbols on the floor with a piece of chalk I found in the box. As I began to recite the incantation, the whispering turned into a roar. The room shook, and the photographs on the walls rattled. I could feel the entity's anger, its desperation to break free. I continued to recite the incantation, my voice growing louder to drown out the roar. The room grew colder, and a dark shadow began to form in the center of the room. It twisted and writhed, taking on a vaguely human shape. The man's face appeared within the shadow, his eyes burning with hatred. I finished the incantation, and for a moment, everything was still. Then, the shadow began to dissipate, the roar fading into a distant whisper. The temperature in the room began to rise, and I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The door creaked open, and the couple rushed in. They looked around the room in cell, shock, but I didn't have the energy to explain. 
I handed them the letter and the book, urging them to keep it safe and to never speak of what had happened. I left the house, vowing never to return. The entity was gone, but the memories lingered. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still watching me, waiting for a moment of weakness. Months passed, and I tried to move on with my life, but the experience had changed me. I became more sensitive to the supernatural, more aware of the things that lurk in the shadows. I continued to research the occult, hoping to find answers, hoping to understand what I had faced. One night, as I was studying a particularly old and obscure text, I heard a familiar whispering. My blood ran cold as the whispering grew louder, more insistent. Let me in. Let me in. I realized with horror that the entity had not been banished. It had followed me, waiting for the right moment to strike. I knew I had to act fast. I gathered my research, the book, and the letter, and began to prepare for another ritual. This time, I was determined to end it for good. I drew the symbols, lit the candles, and began to recite the incantation. The room grew cold, and the shadow began to form again. The man's face appeared, his eyes burning with hatred. I continued to recite the incantation, my voice steady despite my fear. The shadow writhed and twisted, trying to break free, but I didn't stop. I finished the incantation, and the shadow began to dissipate once more. But this time, it didn't disappear completely. Instead, it lingered, a dark, malevolent presence in the corner of the room. I realized with a sinking feeling that the entity was too powerful to be banished completely. It would always be there, waiting. I knew I couldn't let it win. I had to find a way to keep it at bay, to protect myself and others from its influence. I continued my research, delving deeper into the occult, learning everything I could about rituals and protections. I set wards around my home, symbols of protection and banishment. I carried talismans with me at all times, and I never let my guard down. The whispering still came, but it was faint, distant. The entity was still there, but it couldn't reach me. I knew I would never be free of it, but I had learned to live with it. I continued to help others who faced similar threats, using my knowledge to protect them. I became known as an expert in the occult, a guardian against the things that lurk in the shadows, but I never forgot the house, the photographs, the man with the eerie smile. I knew that one day, the entity might find a way to break free. And when that day comes, I will be ready. Until then, I will keep fighting, keep protecting, and keep the darkness at bay. Because I know that once you let it in, it will never let you go.